really bright. <laughs> so at the age of six years old, uh, I immigrated from Egypt. Um, and it was, it was definitely a new experience for me. When I first got here, the first thing I saw was the Statue of Liberty. And the first thing I thought was, wow, it actually exists. Because all you saw in the movies was that there's a big statue, and everybody went to it. But you didn't know why. So when I came to Texas, I thought this was my time to shine. I'm going to be the next Billy the Kid. This was it. Mohanad Ibrahim, gunslinger extraordinaire. <laughs> this was my passion. I had my job all figured out. I was going to go around and do all these things after watching Tom and Jerry chase one another and watching the good, the bad, and the ugly. I thought this was it. But in reality, it wasn't. However, I was really excited about something else. I was excited about school. School was going to be the most fantastic thing I had ever experienced. Because it was going to be my first year of first grade. So when I went in, there were new things to discover, like the food. When back home, you had your breakfast at home, and you had your lunch, which is like a piece of bread with some beans in it. That was lunch. And you carried it with you the whole day, all proud of yourself that you got a bean bread lunch. But when we got here, I, I immediately went to breakfast because I wanted to see where all the other kids were going. And the first thing I saw was yogurt. And I was like, wow, they come in packets, not from a bag. This is, this is crazy. And I immediately grabbed it and I just started eating. And then I noticed that there was muffins. And I was like, this is amazing. And then there was milk. Now, when I tell you, there were so many flavors of milk that I had never seen before in my life. It was astonishing. I picked up the first carton, and I was like, wow, chocolate milk. Where's that from? <laughs> then immediately afterwards, strawberry milk. I was like, how? How is this possible? <laughs> and then the one right after it was just mind-blowing. 2%. What is 2%? <laughs> Who? Who? pulled out 2%. This is crazy. But then I kind of felt in through this, this phase where I went to a predominantly African-American school. So I was the only white kid there, even though I'm African. Okay? Big difference. However, when I went, it was everyone was picking on me because I was three feet tall. All the way up until fifth grade. So I was, I was easy game for everyone. Everyone looked down on me. I never looked up at anybody. And I got bullied. I got bullied so much that I got tired of being bullied and I became the bully. Plot twist. And the way I won most of my fights was because I began punching people in the nose. Now, it's not fun when you punch people in the nose and run away. That's not how a fight's supposed to work. However, my mom would get called so much over me fighting that she rehearsed this, you know, statement every time. They'd say, hey, your son he's causing a lot of trouble, and now my mom speaks perfect English. She goes, I don't speak English, sorry. <laughs> now, the amount of times she did this, I couldn't count, I, I couldn't tell you. But it was, it was every single time until I bit a kid. Now, it wasn't that bad, but when I bit the kid, it's because I wanted to answer a question. And he, wrote, he raised his hand. Now, this was the only question I had known in the entire year. So he was not going to take that moment away from me. But I found my role model. My role model is my mom. Now, she's taught me so much about how helping others can actually help you. She told me that if you don't help anyone now, you're not going to find anyone to help you later. If you're going to always continuously bring forth this battle that you're the tough one and you're the rebellious one, then nobody's going to want to get close to you. Nobody wants to get to know someone that's so tough. Now, this brought forth my inspiration. My inspiration was that I wanted to help others because my mom thought this was a good path for me. Now, at first, I wasn't very keen on the idea. I didn't want to help anybody. I wanted to just play tag, but that wasn't a possibility. Now, this brought me forth to how... And why do we volunteer? Now, when we grow up, most of us volunteer because we enjoy it. 
We enjoy the ability to help others because it's an honor to help others. Now, sometimes we're required to help others. Sometimes we have to put effort into something that we don't want to, but we have to because someone told us to do so. Now, in other times, we're forced to help others. Now, this can be forced whether you feel guilty about not helping them or someone is making you help them. Now, when I moved on from this topic, I wanted to see what volunteering did and how has volunteering become such a thing in the past couple years. Now, believe it or not, it's going in a downward slope. From 1995, 93 million United States Americans volunteered with a combined total of 20.3 billion hours. That is a large number. Now, each year, the Labor Bureau of Statistics does a count of people who work and people who volunteer, and they accumulate all of these hours just so they have some form of database. However, when I decided to see where this went in 2016, I saw that there was a massive shift from 1995. At this point, there had been 62.6 million volunteers and only 3.2 billion hours. That is a massive decrease from the original. This number was so large and so vast at the beginning. What could have happened in less than 30 years? Now, I wanted to go to high school to see where kids begin to understand the idea of volunteering. Now, in high school, we're used to this comprehending that there's a required minimum of 100 hours. Now, who signs off on the hours? Doesn't really matter. All that matters is that you have these 100 hours that you submit into your school. However, do they ever give the student the chance to see if they want to volunteer? Do they ever give the student the chance to wonder what path they want to take to volunteer? Most of the times, it's usually sitting behind a desk and selling honey buns after school. That's what we call fundraisers. However, clubs can sometimes have these volunteering activities. Sometimes, if you go to specific clubs, such as the engineering club, you can fix things around your school or help make things for your community. Now, you don't get paid for these things, but they are all voluntary. Now, the adolescent statistics. I decided to see if there were any surveys conducted within the past couple years that actually focused on high school students. So I found a survey called Youth Helping America. Now this survey, I decided to look at 2005. In 2005, it is stated that approximately 55% of young adults had began their process of volunteering. Now they didn't do it because it was a requirement, they did it because they wanted to give back to their community. Now, in 2006, this number decreased. 10.6 million youth volunteered, approximately 38%. Now, when we think about it, this number is significantly higher than the adult percentage. Now, why is that? Why is it that the adult percentage is so much lower? Well, it's because these students are beginning to understand what volunteering is. They're beginning to branch out and see what they can do. Some people like animals, so they'll volunteer at an animal shelter. Some people would like to do car washes for free. They would like to do that form of fundraiser. But everyone has their specific form of volunteering that they hold true to themselves and not necessarily anyone else. Now, is the youth lacking motivation? The youth is not lacking motivation. The youth has all the motivation necessary. They just need this push. This push, rather than showing them all of these boring activities that we call fundraisers, and bring them these new ideas, or even use some of their own, that someday, this is something that you can do. This is something that you can put up to a board and say, you can join this activity, 
rather than sitting outside and selling honey buns. Now, this is the start for a need for change. These numbers and these statistics are all based on how we grow up. We grow up wanting to make some form of change, whether it be in our community or in the world. And to do that, we have to find within ourselves what means everything to us. Now this, bring forth, this brings forth the era of success. If we bring forth the need for change, we can have an era of success. One where we flourish, not only to help ourselves, but to help others. Now this brings also with it a spark of brilliance. Imagine how many creative ideas and different forms of innovation that can be brought forth of multiple people from around the world bringing themselves together on a common goal. Now, moving towards influence. Now, if we start from a young age, we can make sure that their minds are prepared for the brighter future. Now, how can we make it not a demand? We're not demanding that people volunteer. In fact, we want people to volunteer because that's what they want to do. That's what they enjoy doing. If you make it a demand, who's going to show up? What's the point? We want to make sure that these people have a chance, starting from young, that they can do whatever they want in whatever way they want. Now, we want them to grow. And we want their ideas to grow so that they can someday prove this to someone else. We don't want them to shrink and become zombies. We just want to make sure that their ideas are put and placed in where they need to be. Now, how can you make the difference? Asking for help isn't a weakness. It is a privilege. A privilege that we all have that sometimes we do not rely on. Now, giving help isn't a chore. Volunteering is not something you do because it's a chore. It is a fulfilling life choice. Now, if I were asked if there was someone in need or if there was an opportunity that you or someone around you could be helped, and the process that was needed was to be volunteered, then I would do so. Thank you.